This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. Today, you're listening to Southern Remedy, Healthy and Fit on MPB Think Radio. I'm your host, Josie Bidwell, Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine and Nurse Practitioner at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. And today, we're going to be talking about snacks and whether we should be having them in our day or if we should, what should we be choosing? If you have a favorite snack that you love, I'd love to hear it. Um, our number is one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four, or you can email us fit at mpbonline dot org. So snacks, I think, and snack time is one of the most um, biggest missed opportunities for getting in some good nutrition, but also a really misunderstood part of a nutritional plan um, because we tend to think about things in all forms of nutrition, we think about things in very cut and dry manners and very good or bad or black and white. And most things in nutrition and and really in healthy living in its entirety, whether we're talking about physical activity or sleep or any of these things, uh, there are kind of gray areas and, and things that we can you know, not be so rigid about. And really that's kind of the secret to sustainability is not being so kind of set on a certain thing, having a a game plan or a blueprint, so to speak, and having some flexibility um, in there. Um, One thing I tell my patients um, on whatever it is we're talking about uh, related to lifestyle is perfection is not required, but intentionality is. So improvements in our health don't just kind of fall in our lap, so to speak. It takes some intentionality to it, some planning, some preparation to to start to see better health. And so when I get asked all the time uh, by folks, they'll say, you know, should I be snacking or are snacks good or bad? And there's just really not a yes or no answer to that. It depends on several things. Um, what you're snacking on is, is one of those, and we'll talk about talk about that, and I think maybe you'll be surprised at some of the things I say. Um, why you're snacking, and that's a, a big one, and where I want to spend a good amount of time today is, is why we snack, right? Um, the frequency of snacks, and then, ha- again, how they fit into your overall kind of way of eating or your overall eating plan. And so I put out a question uh, this morning on Facebook about snacks and kind of asked folks what their favorite kind of go-to snack was if they were a snacker. And if they weren't a snacker, you know, what, you know, why weren't they snacking? And I've gotten um, some varied responses. You know, I've gotten some fruit and and nuts as um, some response. I actually just got one in that says, if I'm going to snack, I choose an apple or a banana followed by no or low salt pistachio nuts, pecans, or a health warrior chia bar. Avoiding snacking is still a work in progress. And that's just a great response all the way around because it gave us some some suggestions of, of what this person is doing, but also that last sentence, avoiding snacking is still a work in progress. And so I would counter that with, why do you think you need to avoid snacking, right? And that's a, a deeper discussion about how it fits into your overall eating pattern. But I also got um, things like ice cream, um, and that's okay. Um, my favorite snack is popcorn. Um, so any snack can fit into your overall nutrition pattern. But when we look at kind of nationally, like what what do U.S. folks, Americans, what do we snack on? Well, it's Fruit, cookies, chips, ice cream, candy, popcorn, soft drinks, crackers, cake, milk, nuts, seeds, tea, and yogurt. That Those are the winners when we look at the frequency of that. Now, 
you could very easily make you a list of, of things and say, well, these are the good ones and these are the bad ones. But I would encourage you not to do that, right? If you've listened to me talk before, you know, I very much don't like to to set up things as good versus bad, right? And it's just really foods we need to eat more of and foods we need to eat less of. And when we look at that list, there are things that you can pick out on there, right? There are the ones that we would consider healthier options like fruit or nuts and seeds, yogurts, that kind of thing. And then the ones that are are not so great for us, like soft drinks and chips and candy and cake. But does that mean we never have any of those? There are some folks who would say yes. Um, I tend to lean more toward the let's see how we can make it fit, right? Because in general, general, and remember I'm always talking kind of in generalities when we're talking about kind of public health information, in general, most folks are not going to do well with complete restriction of something. Um, they may do well for a while, but uh, birthday parties happen or an anniversary or you go on a trip and there's something there. And consuming that item then leads to the, the guilt around it. I usually cringe whenever I see the things that say, you know, snacking guilt-free. And I'm like, really, all food should be guilt-free um, because we're attaching a little bit too much uh, emotional weight to that food to kind of give us give it the power to, to make us feel guilty. When food is just food and eating yummy things is okay, we just want to make sure that we build it into our eating plan and our eating pattern to support the health goals that we're trying to achieve. So there's, you know, nothing kind of off limits. We just want balance, right? And I tend to use the word balance instead of the term moderation, um, but really striving for that balance in our plate and that balance of what we're eating. So when we look at what is driving a lot of our snacks choices, um, a lot of it has to do with food marketing. About 80% of the kind of budget spent on food marketing is marketed toward fast food items or packaged convenience products. We don't see a whole lot of marketing around things like fresh fruits and veggies. Um, the nut industry has some, some pretty good marketing around it. You can think of the pistachio commercials and the Fisher's nuts and that kind of thing. So there's some marketing around that. But by and large, most of the commercials that you see on television are going to be for fast food restaurants or for convenience products. And that then drives us to choose those things because convenience does matter when we're we're building our, our, our eating patterns in this kind of crazy, fast paced. Uh, world that we're living in. So it doesn't, again, doesn't mean we don't choose those. It's just about how we balance them out and how we uh, round out that plate. So a lot of times people will come, um, come to they'll see me maybe eating uh, some chips and they'll say, I can't believe you're eating that, right? That's not healthy. And, you know, it kind of takes me back a little bit because it's, those are okay. And it's okay to eat those things. But I want you to focus on what you can add to the snack to balance that out, right? Because the serving size of chips is not a lot, right? If you're not familiar with reading nutrition labels, it's really important to kind of flip it over and look at that, at least that serving size on the top uh, and see how many servings are in that bag, right? Because it it may look like a single serve uh, bag of something or something that you reasonably could consume in a single serving but it may actually contain two or three servings in that in that bag. And so while something may appear to be not that calorie dense, if we eat the whole thing, it can be. So a serving size of chips is about an ounce, which depending on the chip is somewhere between about 12 to 16 chips, which is not a lot, right? And so if we are snacking because we're hungry, and I'll get into why we snack um, in just a few minutes, If we're snacking because we're hungry and we eat 15 chips, we are not full. Uh, And so that usually leads to overconsumption of that really calorie-dense food item that we had there, which in this specific example is uh, chips. And so if we eat chips until we're full, it's a lot of calories, a lot of sodium that we've taken in right there, and it may not match so well with our overall kind of health goals that we have for ourselves. But if we can add something 
something that's lower in calorie and higher in fiber still have that serving of chips, right? But balance it out with something that's going to take up more room in your belly to fill you up, but has less calories and more nutrition overall, which may be something like um, uh, some fresh veggies cut up. It makes a great kind of addition to like some tortilla chips and some salsa and adding in some cut up veggies there because then you get to enjoy your chips, right? But also add some nutrition in there to balance it out. I'm Josie Bidwell, Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine and Nurse Practitioner at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Thanks for listening to the Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit Podcast. If you have a question, you can email fit at mpbonline.org. For ongoing information on staying healthy and fit, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. Hi, I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, host of Southern Remedies Relatively Speaking, a show that explores issues that relate to you and your family. From mental health obstacles and family interactions to handling life disruptions, whatever it is, we're here to help. Find out what we're all about and subscribe to the podcast by using any podcast app or by downloading our MPB public media app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Listening to Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit on MTV Think Radio. I'm Josie Bidwell, nurse practitioner at UMMC, and today we're talking about snacks and whether they should be a part of your uh, nutrition pattern. If you have a question or a comment for us, you can give us a call at 877-672-7464. And I believe we have a question in the studio from Michelle. Good morning. Um, Thank you for being here, of course, every Monday with us on uh, uh, Southern Remedy. We love what you do. I'll answer, I, as I was waiting to ask my question, you posed the question, what's our favorite snack? So I'll go, I'll lead with that. Um, okay. I like chips. I'm a chip person. So mm-hmm. I know chips aren't, like you've been saying, necessarily healthy. And I will sit at my desk and eat. I like Lay's. I love that thin, Mm -hmm. crispy chip. And I like the new kettle ones because they're crunchy and, oh, I love that. So I decided to look for another alternative, another option of that, uh, like you said, why do I want that crunch? Or that's the reason why I'm snacking. Maybe it's not just the chip per se, but the act of going in the bag or the feel I have in my mouth. So Mm -hmm. I found the Ritz Chips. Sour cream and onion. They have, I think they have cheddar or just regular Ritz flavor, but they are light and crispy, and they taste so good. Maybe a let you know a better option than just regular chips because they're baked yeah. and not fried. Now I know again with anything in moderation, you can't eat just a whole bag of Ritz chips. <laughs> Probably the same. Well, um, you can, but <laughs> calorie- it might not be. Be what you need to do. Right, right. But that was my that's my snack to go now. Um, Ritz chips, they're really good. The sour cream and onion is my favorite flavor. And you feel like you're eating a chip, but you're not, and you feel a little better. But my comment is uh, while you were talking, I remember a while ago, I think on Dr. Um, with Dr. Butchers, we were talking about healthy eating with children. And mm-hmm. isn't it easier not to even introduce certain foods to your children? Um, at an early age, so they won't crave it. So some kids love snacking or love candy and love this and that. Some kids never had it at all. I've met some right. kids who've never had sugar, like raw sugar, and they don't eat mm-hmm. junk food because their parents never introduced it. So right. my, my comment or question to you is, isn't it easier not to introduce it to where you have to take it back or curtail it later on in life when they get older and teenagers and things. If you start now at a young age and introducing healthier snacks or maybe just fruits and vegetables and, you know, add in some fun stuff, but do it in a healthier mm-hmm. way, it's easier later on. And they and then as well as when they become adults and live on their own, they might not even have a taste for it. Right. Um, correct? So it's, it's much, much easier to establish habits 
when we're young, right? So there's kind of absolutely that kind of you're spot on there. You know, what we don't want to do or what I try not to do with, with children is, again, make them feel good or bad you know, based off of what they're, they're eating. And so you can absolutely not introduce those things to your kiddos at all. And that's a perfectly viable strategy. Um, when we think about the word easier, we have to think about what that means in the totality of our life though. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's absolutely easier to get them set up for eating, you know, really nutritious foods and avoiding all these snack foods and that kind of thing. But if that is not going to work in your overall lifestyle, right? Maybe right. you're sending them to to daycares and don't have as much control over what snack items somebody might bring in, right? Or, you know, something like that. Or you have to choose kind of more convenience items to to get that food to to your child, right? We, we've got to think about food insecurity um, and how that plays into the foods that we, you know, have access to and are able to offer people. And so I don't think that there's, again, a, a real black and white answer mm-hmm. to that. You know, it absolutely is, is easier to establish healthy eating patterns in a child. But is that going to be overall, you know, healthier and easier for the family unit? Or is it going to, you know, negatively impact mom or dad's mental health by trying to, you know, prepare completely whole food meals every time right. and so it's going to look a little different in each person and i think we have to you know give a little bit of, a little bit of grace and a little bit of leeway there now that is not meaning that i think we should give processed snacks to kids three times a day right. Um, but, right but we want to help establish those good healthy eating patterns um all across the lifespan um so that they do start to reach for those things that are less processed and more full of fiber and nutrients and those kinds of things. So that's an excellent comment. Another comment I just thought about while yeah. you were talking. It's interesting what well, you have parents who say, well, no, I don't want you to drink that sugary soda. But at dinner time, they have a Coca-Cola and they give a child a <laughs> apple juice. And right. th- it's important and I'm raising my hand. My daughter is 18 now, but it is important for parents to uh, exemplify those habits that we're trying to instill in our children. It's not easy, yeah, but we have to do them in the house as well. Or you could sneak in your room and have it in your closet if you want. Well, that's a whole different kind of unhealthy <laughs> habit that, that we've developed in there. Right. But again, it's important for our children to see us doing the things we're telling them to do as well. Absolutely. Healthy snacking yeah. and things like that. If we can do it here, we can make it a entire a whole family thing and we can do it together and that's really kind of one of the secret elements to kind of successful lifestyle change is doing it as a family unit right and making those things a priority within the family unit because kids don't live in a bubble right and parents don't live in a bubble and so we have to find a middle ground that's kind of good enough for, for everyone, where we're supporting good, healthy habits in, in everyone in the family. You know, so many people come, come to see me in, in clinic and they'll say, you know, I'm just exhausted because I'm cooking two different meals. You know, one for myself because I'm trying to watch my salt and my fat and then one for my family. And that is exhausting, right? And that is likely something that's not going to be sustainable for for everyone for the majority of, of their life, right? And so we have to figure out how we can strike a balance in providing healthy, nutritious meals um, to everyone uh, and and building in that support, really, because the support is what it, it takes. And kids do look to parents um, for, for cues and in, in the ha- habits that they're supposed to take. And that goes with, you know, physical activity as well and making sure that our kids see us being mobile. They don't have to see us, you know, lifting weights and running marathons. It's great if they do. But, you know, they need to see us prioritizing taking a walk in the afternoons or taking the stairs instead of the elevator, if that's something that we're able to do. And they pick up on those cues. And the same goes for uh, nutrition. It goes for screen time as well. You know, we talk to kids about kind of not watching so much television or not eating in front of the TV and those kinds of things, but then they see us do it. Um, and it's confusing for them. So they have to, they do look to us to take, um, you know, take their cues and, and establish their lifelong habits that way. Um, so that was great, Michelle. Thanks for, for kind of spurring that conversation. And that kind of really leads us in to 
why we snack, right? And there are a variety of reasons why we snack. The kind of most readily apparent one would be hunger, right? And eating when you're hungry is okay, right? If we're hungry, then that you know we're it's important to kind of respond to those cues. What we need to make sure before we snack is that it's not one of the things going on that is making us snack. A big one is boredom. Um, another one is distracted eating, which I kind of alluded to when I talked about eating in front of the television or in front of the screens. Um, that's a that's a big one. Or eating eating at your desk during lunch and not. It's fine to eat at your desk, but we want to focus on the food and you know, not kind of be multitasking and, and typing emails and those kinds of things. Um, and then uh, kind of a, the society and food culture that we're in, think about uh, when you go to an event, right? There's usually going to be food there, and most of us are going to nibble and snack on that food regardless of whether we're hungry or not. And so all of those kind of play into that why we snack right, and why we choose the things that we do. And snacking that is not caused by hunger, so when we're doing the distracted eating or the boredom eating or the stress eating, that type of snacking pattern really sets us up to take in an overall excess of calories, right? You can build in snacks and snack when you're hungry and kind of stay within a healthy calorie range. But when we start to incorporate these other reasons for snacking in, um, we tend to consume more calories than we actually need to run our bodies. And that's why snacking can often get a kind of a bad rap in terms of weight management and not being able to snack when we're trying to lose weight. When we look at just the kind of phenomenon of stress eating, um, which is very prevalent. Um, you know, a lot of the people that come to see me are stress eaters, you know, and we really kind of set it up that way in our culture when we think about the word comfort food, right, and that we're deriving comfort from our foods. Um, but when we do eat in response to stress, we choose more energy-dense snacks. And I use those terms sometimes on the show, you kind of energy-dense or calorie-dense and nutrient dense. And really that just means the amount of something kind of per bite of it. So when something is energy dense or calorie dense, it means that per, you know, per little bit of it, per bite of it, it's got a lot of calories in it, right? Whereas something that is nutrient dense is got a lot of other nutrients in it per bite. So a lot more fiber, vitamins and minerals, those types of things. And when we're trying to maintain a healthy weight or lose weight, we want to eat things that are less calorie dense or energy dense and things that are more nutrient dense. And that goes for kind of all health, not just weight ma management or weight maintenance. But if we're trying to improve our gut health, if we're trying to get better control of our blood sugar, if we're trying to lower our blood pressure or our cholesterol, Choosing those things that have more nutrients in them and less calories per bite allow us to snack. So it really drives back down to the, the root of why we are snacking, right? And so there are various strategies out there for that. There's the old, you know, leave it at the grocery store strategy. You know, if you know you have a particular trigger food or something that you're likely to eat a lot of, without uh, paying attention to portion. Uh, I know uh, Michelle mentioned those Lay's chips. Um, I really, really like the kettle cooked jalapeno chips. They are delicious. Um, and so the majority of the time I do leave them at the store because I don't need to eat those all the time. But just because we leave something at the store doesn't mean that craving goes away, right? And so that craving may be triggered by a variety of things like stress. Right? And if it is, we want to address that root underlying cause of why it is we crave the things that we crave, right? Instead of just trying to have willpower to, to you know, power through it and not eat that. So that's not a viable long-term strategy usually. Maybe it's sleep. We talked about sleep a couple weeks ago on the show, and we talked about those hormones that get out of whack when we don't sleep well. We talked about the hunger hormone and the hormone that makes us feel full and satisfied and how those get all out of balance and we are 
hangrier um, when we don't sleep well, and it's usually for these very energy-dense, calorie-dense, highly palatable foods. Um, And so addressing the root cause of why we crave what we crave uh, is really a a better strategy overall than just trying to avoid things completely. I'm Josie Bidwell, Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine and Nurse Practitioner at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Thanks for listening to the Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit Podcast. If you have a question, you can email fit at mpbonline.org. For ongoing information on staying healthy and fit, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. Hi, I'm Ryder Taff, Portfolio Manager at New Perspectives, a fee-only financial advisory and co-host of Money Talks. Each week, we take your personal finance questions and tell you about a money topic we hope you find helpful. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. Podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org, or on your smart device's podcasting platform. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Today here on Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, I'm Josie Bidwell, nurse practitioner at UMMC, and we've been kind of exploring uh, the role of snacks in our overall nutrition pattern or the way that we eat and whether they're a good thing or a bad thing. If you have a question or comment for us about that or you want to share your favorite snack, our number is one 672 7464 And when we look at snacking, right? So before the break, we talked about some of the reasons why we snack, one being hunger, um, which is okay, and some of the others being a little bit more kind of maladaptive, uh, being stressed eating or um, boredom or distracted eating. And it's going to look different for, for everyone, right? And it doesn't mean that you're bad if you, if you snack when you're feeling those ways. We just want to help you kind of dig down and look at kind of the root reason why you're reaching for things and how you can balance that out if that's something that you're looking for in your life, right? If you're looking to, you know, lose weight or get better control of, you know, your heart health or your blood sugar, those different kinds of things. And we talked about eating in front of the television, those kinds of things, and that really does fall into that distracted eating. And so if you find yourself, you know, being someone who does that, right, and and you go, well, you know, Josie, I'm just not going to stop eating snacks in front of the TV. That's fine, right? There's always a strategy that we can employ with that, right? So what I usually work with folks on with, with that particular one is smaller portions of things. So instead of taking the bag of chips to the living room to sit in front of the television and, and munch on, because you will plow through way more than 15 chips when you do that. <coughs> Excuse me is kind of pre-portioning things out, right? So maybe you go ahead and portion out a serving of chips and grab you something else that's more nutrient-dense to go along with it, maybe a dip that you're going to dip it in, some hummus or some guacamole or something like that, and take that serving to the living room to eat. Um, That just kind of slows you down. Once you kind of reach for the last one, you have to think, do I really want to get up and go get another serving of this? And so you can buy prepackaged, you know, pre, um, pre-portioned out servings, and that's completely fine. That is more expensive usually. So we usually do um, portion things out at my house. We have a cookie jar that sits on the counter, and that, it, that works for us. But they are pre-portioned. So I take little, you know, little baggies, and I take out you know, uh, two of these little small cookies and add them to those bags, put that in the cookie jar. That way you just kind of grab one of those as you're, you know, going, uh, going about your business to do. So there's always a strategy that we can put in, right? Not perfection, but intentionality. So I intentionally portion those things out to set my family up for a little bit more success there. I often get asked, well, what about when I'm going to these parties, right? So I know there's going to be food there. What should I do? Well, you know, one strategy is to always take a dish with you, right? Something that you know kind of meets 
um, what you're hoping to achieve, right? Maybe it's a fruit tray or a veggie tray or something that is heavy on the fruit and veggie. Um, if you know it's going to be somewhere where there's not going to be a ton of healthy items there, think about having a, having a small meal before you go, right? Whether that's like a soup and a salad kind of thing that takes up a lot of room in your belly um, so that you don't indulge more than you would normally do. And then don't stand at the snack table, right? If you want a snack, you get up, go fix you a plate and bring it back to where you're going. But don't just kind of stand and graze at that snack table uh, there. And, you know, after you've finished your plate, give it 15 or 20 minutes before you get back up and go go kind of grab, grab another one, right? Um, and really give your belly time to, and your brain time to catch up with your belly and sensing your kind of fullness cues there, right? So what if you've done all of these things and you just still have a craving for something, right? And just nothing is going to do other than, you know, having having a snack, right? Whether it be a salty snack or a sweet snack. Again, let's talk about balance, right? Maybe you are a, a chocolate person, right? You really, really enjoy chocolate. My husband does not think that the meal has come to an end unless there is something chocolate at the end. And it does not have to be some extravagant anything, but he enjoys that chocolate. That's his cue that food time is over with, right? And that's an important strategy is establishing some type of routine in the evening that kind of signals your brain that that food time is over, right? And that we're winding down and getting ready for, for bed in essence. And so some great things that you can do with that is, again, take that kind of calorie-dense item, which would be your chocolate, and pair it with something that is more nutrient-dense. So that's often something like fruit. And that can seem relatively easy to say, but how do we operationalize that, right? Well, you know, one of our favorite kind of evening um, after dinner kind of wrap-ups is apple nachos. So it sounds fancier than it is. It's really just your favorite apple, which our mine is Honeycrisp. Um, wash it really good. Cut it up into, um, you know, little wedges. And then heat up a little bit of nut butter in the microwave, whether it be peanut butter, or almond butter, whatever you enjoy there. Um, and drizzle that over your cut up apples. And then sprinkle them with some mini dark chocolate chips. Right, and it doesn't take very many when you use the little the little mini ones because they spread so easily, like like sprinkles all over your nachos or like like cheese, if you were thinking about your nachos. And that is a great way to pair that chocolate taste that you really really enjoy and you're really craving with something that's going to take up more room in your belly uh, for less calories and also throw in some added fiber there. So there's lots of options that you can can use with the, with those kinds of things. One other thing we tend to think about um, are uh, like cakes and cookies and pies and those kinds of things. And again, you can have some of those. Just think about how perhaps you decrease the portion size of that while adding something. When we think about diets, we tend to think about them only in terms of restriction, right? And so, okay, well, I can have a cookie, but I can only have one cookie. We'll have that one cookie, but what can we add to that snack that is going to fill you up so that you don't feel deprived, right? And make sure you pair the snack that you're choosing with the kind of craving that you're, you're wanting, right? If you're craving something salty, then eating berries is not going to kind of squish that craving that you're having there. And so that craving is going to kind of continue hanging around and you're either going to feel very deprived and grumpy or you're going to then go back and reach for something salty, right? So try and pair whatever snack it is that you're choosing to, to what it is you're really wanting. I see that a lot with reduced calorie foods and 100 calorie packs and those kinds of things, which again, there's nothing wrong with, you know, a 100 calorie pack snack if you really want that. Um, but a lot of times, it leaves you unsatisfied because it, you know, like it doesn't taste exactly like what you were craving. And so you eat that 100 calorie pack of something and then you also go eat 
something else after that because you left that craving unsatisfied, right? So maybe a smaller portion of the, the what you actually wanted kind of fluffed out with a bigger portion of something that you um, that you might not have considered at night time, right? Um, uh, Kevin and I were talking uh, over the break, and he said he was really starting to to love bananas now. And I think that's so interesting in the fact that it was not something that he would have considered kind of his snack choice before, but he's just kind of started incorporating it more into his, his daily habits. And now he really enjoys that. And your taste buds do kind of change over time, you know? And so there may be things that previously you thought, I don't like that. But in reality, you just haven't tried it in a while. And so maybe adding it back in and trying it, you may find that there's a, you know, a new favorite that you had. I am in love with raspberries right now. And probably five years ago, I would would not have cared a thing about a raspberry. Um, but I tried them again recently. They were delicious. And they're actually the way I get my little chocolate um, fix in. The little hole in the top of a raspberry is the perfect size for a chocolate chip. So you can just stuff that little chocolate chip right in that little hole, and then I just pair it with some yogurt, right? And so now I've got some good lean protein from my yogurt. I've got some good fiber and antioxidants from my raspberries. And then I've got that little pop of kind of sweetness and chocolate flavor going on in there, and that can be a great snack. Something like that can also be a replacement for ice cream. But if ice cream is your, like, thing that you have to have, think again about how you can balance that out. Maybe a smaller serving of that ice cream and then add something like berries to it. That way you still get what you want, but you fill up on some lower calorie, more nutrient dense items there. I'm Josie Bidwell, Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine and Nurse Practitioner at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Thanks for listening to the Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit Podcast. If you have a question, you can email fit at mpbonline.org. For ongoing information on staying healthy and fit, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Joining us today, everyone, you're listening to Southern Remedy, Healthy and Fit on MPB Think Radio. I'm your host, Josie Bidwell, nurse practitioner at UMMC, and we've been exploring stacking today and whether that's a healthy habit or not. And, you know, it's not cut and dry. There are pros and cons to all of it, but the way I think about snack time is it is a, a the opportunity to either boost your nutrition or go the other way and kind of kind of derail your efforts for uh, whatever health goal you're trying to achieve. And it really depends on why you're why you're snacking and what you're snacking on, right? And so uh, when we look at nutrition patterns overall and kind of the the meals that people eat, fruit and veggies are often not as well represented at meal time. Um, And so snack time is an excellent opportunity to get that extra nutrition in, right? And, you know, why do I kind of harp on fruits and vegetables so much? They are one of the most fundamental uh, parts of a healthful eating pattern, right? And I don't mean just in terms of weight. I mean just overall health and and living well and living with less disease or better control of our disorders, fruits and veggies are just where it's at. Um, they've got such a, um, you know, a, a low calorie content for the majority of them um, while having a lot of bulk. So they fill us up. They have 
tons of vitamins and minerals, which are important for our overall health. They're full of antioxidants, which help to decrease inflammation and help with pain and help with um, kind of chronic inflammation and also really good for keeping our brains nice and healthy, those types of things. Um, and, they're, you know, going back to that fiber, fiber is fundamental for our gut health and keeping our, you know, the bacteria that live in our gut, the gut microbiome nice and happy. They like fiber. Um, they're great. That fiber is great for lowering cholesterol. Okay, that, that fiber kind of acts like a broom and helps sweep some of those things out. And for maintaining the actual health of our colon, right? So if we're looking at decreasing the risk of colon cancer development, keeping everything kind of swept out and cleaned out, from a colon standpoint, is very, very important as well. And fiber only lives in plant foods, right? So fruits, veggies, grains, nuts, seeds, those kinds of things. So if maybe mealtime doesn't check all those boxes for getting your fruits and veggies, snack time is an excellent way to kind of get some of those in there. But like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, Good nutrition, good health does not happen by accident, right? So if you do not kind of plan out some healthier snacks in your day, you're not going to reach for healthy snacks in your day, right? When you get hungry or you get bored or you get stressed, you're going to reach for what you have available. So if you keep a candy bowl on your desk, that's where you're going to go, right? Or to the vending machine, all those different places. Now, that doesn't mean you can't do that, right? What I usually do is, you know, go down to the vending machine when I'm not starving or stressed or any of those different kinds of things and take a little survey of what's available in there, right? So I know what my healthier choices are going to be in that vending machine, right? So that I don't just kind of panic and get, um, you know, a candy bar that's that's not going to give me the nutrition that I need. I'm actually probably going to crash from that in just, you know, just a couple of minutes. Oh, not a couple of minutes, but a couple of hours. I'm going to crash down from that, right? But planning and having things with you greatly increases your risk of being able to do things, right? So right now in my bag, um, I have dried apricots. That they are, that's the snack I'm on right now. Like I really, really enjoy dried apricots. They're, they're chewy and sweet and I love them. And I have um, some pecans with that, right? And so that will be um, my kind of mid-afternoon snack that I have going on there. Replace that candy bowl with maybe a bowl of um, cuties or little clementine oranges, right? They don't require any refrigeration or, you know, anything to, to prep and use those. Bananas, things like that. Don't overbuy. Just buy what you will realistically use kind of while you're, while you're at work or at school, those kinds of things, and have those available. Um, but uh, we talked about kids before. Uh, you know, kids, little bellies are smaller, right? And so offering them uh, fruits and veggies at snack time and integrating those in in between meal times is often a, a way to make sure that they eat those instead of kind of pushing those to the side on their plate when they're served with the main meal. So, um, you know, making sure that we add those things in is a great way to make sure that our kiddos are getting um, the nutrients that they tend to miss um, in, you know, kind of the, the, the standard American diet that we do at mealtimes, which is usually lower in fiber, vitamin D, potassium, those kinds of things, and higher in, you know, sugar and salt and, and fat. Right, so think about making uh, little uh, dippable things for your kiddos. That's a great way to get them to try more fruits and veggies. Um, one thing that we do is we actually use a little muffin pan, and one side of the muffin pan has like little cut up veggies in it. it has you know carrots and broccoli and cauliflower and bell peppers and those kinds of things. The other side has um, fruits, you know, uh, whatever fruits we're enjoying there. And then the other little containers on that, some of them have savory dips. So maybe a ranch dip, which, yes, that's fine if that's what gets your kiddo to, to try that carrot. Um, some hummus, some guacamole, some salsa, something like that. And then also a sweet 
uh, you know, one or two sweet dips that you have over there, which our favorite is um, a uh, yogurt mixed with peanut butter um, and a little drizzle of maple syrup in there. That makes a delicious and wonderful fruit dip. And, you know, set that out as um, as your after school snack time uh, buffet and see what uh, what happens there if your kiddos We'll start to try and incorporate some of those things in there. But the take home from today is the fact that snacks are not bad and snacks are not good. Snacks can be a wonderful opportunity to add in some of the things that we are deficient in in our diet. But we should be snacking because we are we want a snack. We are hungry, um, and that is why we are snacking. We are trying to avoid using food to fill in things where we're just stressed or bored, or distracted, when we can really use other strategies for dealing with those things, treating that underlying stress, learning some stress management techniques, some mindfulness-based principles. We've talked a lot on this show about breathing exercises and uh, distraction techniques that we can use when we're dealing with that, focusing in on our sleep and making sure that we're addressing uh, our sleep and getting good quality sleep. And then, you know, giving ourselves a little bit of grace when it comes to enjoying the things that we really, really enjoy and learning how to balance those things that may be more energy dense with some things that are more nutrient dense so that overall we have a better nutrition profile. And stick with it. You know, there's a kind of a a misinformation out there about how long it takes to form a habit. You'll hear a lot of people say it takes two weeks to form a habit, and that really is not not true. It can take up to two months for a habit to be really incorporated into your regular routine and be seen as part of your routine. So stick with it. Try incorporating some of these things and, and give yourself time to get get that habit built into your routine. Thanks for listening to this MPB Think Radio podcast. MPB depends on support from listeners, so if you can, please contribute today at mpbonline.org. Hey, this is Larry Morrissey with the Mississippi Arts Commission. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. We talk with visual artists, musicians, writers, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. on Think Radio, or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite